My name is Simo Garlich and I'm um, going to have the following topics today. First of all, I would like to give a brief introduction about myself. Uh, then I would like to talk about um, two projects mainly uh, that I brought to you today. And uh, then I want to share my philosophy whenever uh, I'm approaching new use cases, uh, what I'm doing then, what I'm thinking about it, and uh, how I'm then making a decision. And uh, as da Daniel already mentioned uh, in the second half, of this hour, I would like to give you the opportunity to speak about your own use cases, talk about the projects maybe, and yeah, who am I? Ah. Hmm? <laughs> I would like to guide you uh, sh shortly through this. Uh, my name is Simo Galix, and uh, these are some logos of the companies I've been working for, uh, except from uh, the one <laughs> in the corner, that's my home, that's my home region. Um, that's us, Friesland, northern of Germany. Uh, I've been working for Deutsche, Apple and IBM so far and at the moment I'm working for Union Investment. And from July on, this will be my one and only employer, uh, Ticket, which will be one of the projects I'm going to talk about today. A ticketing platform, we'll uh, introduce that a bit more and for the pr uh, presentation. I'm also an alumnus uh, of Frankfurt School and have studied um, business information systems, so that's my connection to Frankfurt School. So, what are the two projects for today? Um, the first, first project I'm going to talk about uh, is Ethereum Trading, a fund management platform I built uh, within my thesis. And the second, as mentioned, uh, will be Tikif, your key to experience, a ticketing platform uh, which is also uh, a live production pro um, project, so not only a prototype anymore. But first, before we can go into those projects, uh, I want to show you a project which was my first one. And uh, as always, when you start with new technology, you might not do everything right or completely wrong, especially when there is almost no documentation. And I think you can learn a lot about it damn Ethereum uh, and how not to do something within that. Uh, there was a marketplace um, which we built within a university project. Um, you can simply buy and sell goods there, but you cannot pay via Ethereum there in, those <laughs> in that project. Uh, and it's, you can access it via mobile phone, via desktop. And what kind of consequences that, had, that has is kind of easy. I mean, when you're using your phone, there's status so far. But uh, not all of us got status, so uh, you have sort of a centralized database, which is completely against the approach of decentralization with Ethereum. So uh, it is more or less like a really slow database. I mean, uh, we just had a small web server in between. Um, that was in the year, um, at the end of the year 2016. There was Web3 already, but uh, we were, uh, in a phase where we want to learn something new, so we tried Ruby. There's a library for that. Like, I mean, you can almost find for any single programming language a library. That's kind of normal. And if you're going to technologies where um, a lot of people are using it already, mostly it's kind of good. But it's getting better in Ethereum, but still, I can only advise you only to use uh, the Node.js one, so uh, not Node.js, uh, the Web3 API, so the JavaScript one, or maybe the consensus one uh, for, for Python in the future. Um, because when you're coding it on your own, with every single update, there are some changes, and uh, please standardize there. I mean, th if you're, you already have to handle your own smart contract logic. Uh, if you're also coding your own API, that's just too much at once. Really, you're just not having fun with that. So after that completely wrong project and the learnings out of that, I mean, decentral, but centralized database, <laughs> those are two different walls. I mean, when you start with Ethereum or with any other kind of blockchain technology or just uh, decentralized file storage, it just feels like you want to use more, more and more data. There's so much in a web shop which is just completely not transaction critical. 
I mean, you have maybe have your, uh, what have I viewed within the last 30 days and so on. Sure, you can store that, but I, I cannot stress that enough. Uh, store those things maybe separately in a database, but not in a smart contract. It's heavily expensive, not really quick, and especially not accessible for all people. And as I mentioned, uh, libraries just use the standard ones, so focus maybe on uh, Node.js or something similar, so that you can uh, use those and can use them as simple, just addition. I mean, um, I mean if, you, uh, if I've already used Web3, it doesn't feel like it's something that new. I mean, sure, it's a bit slower than uh, storing data in a normal database, but it still feels like normal JavaScript. Just the smart contract coding is sort of different. And really place blocks where they belong. Um, now, where I've shown you um, a project which was not really uh, great, I want to show you something completely decentralized, which is Ethereum trading. Um, with Ethereum trading, uh, you have the opportunity to um, buy and sell um, cryptocurrencies. And uh, if you, uh, you want to uh, share your, uh, your strategy, you can also have the opportunity to create your own portfolio with it. And, and then other people can buy that portfolio and can have that into their deposit account. And uh, the thing is here, Again, I mean, there's lots of data in it, like the pricing, which is absolutely transaction critical. I mean, if you have the prices stored somewhere else, you could change them, maybe you don't know the vendor. It's like, mm. is it really true what they pushed in there? Or maybe they want, just wanted to do some fraud? I mean, that's something why the blockchain is so beautiful. For absolutely transaction critical data, there's no one who can change it. So. Data um, outside of that, I mean, uh, as you all know, in Germany we have, a, have also some uh, taxes you have to pay on uh, financial winnings. Those sort of stuff is something which needs to be calculated, but maybe it's just too complex and especially too complex to change then later on to do that also on the blockchain. And who of you wants other people to have the opportunity to look inside of the blockchain and see how much taxes you're paying or not paying. I mean, <laughs> sure, you can uh, you could tell on other people if you want or not, <laughs> if they're maybe doing tax, you know, tax fraud. So um, the major difference was here uh, that there is external information. So this sort of oracle, that's, that's what it's called in Ethereum, um, needs to be extremely trusted. So maybe uh, in a production environment, you would need um, multiple institutions who are um, monitoring is really the correct price there. Multiple uh, exchanges would, um, would need to be included so that you really can be sure it's absolutely true what's coming in there because, well, it's getting pushed through your geth node into the smart contract and this is a single point of truth. Nothing. What's uh, in there can be changed by somebody from outside, except from the external information, which is sort of uh, a point of leak. I mean, if somebody would hack into your Oracle, could, uh, could push a price in there, could uh, sell your shares and uh, lose some money with it, and somebody else who committed fraud could win something with it. So that's basically uh, smart contract and debugging is already um, kind of complicated, but um, it's even more important to have any single information which is stored outside of the blockchain and coming from outside of the blockchain to secure that. I mean, then again, with a web browser and MetaMask, you can simply access that without um, an additional API needed, just within a normal browser or also the Brave browser from the makers of MetaMask, which uh, enables you to do that. So what do you have learned from that, from that project? A fully decentralized approach is absolutely wonderful. I mean, you don't have to have a web server if you want. You can also just share your websites in a repository and just give that to other people. 
if it's fully decentralized, other people could also create a front end for your application without any API keys or something like that. You can just simply program it, publish it, do something completely open source, which is really cool. But uh, especially, as I uh, explained, some laws and some calculations are just too complex. I mean, if you're just reading from the blockchain, I'm sure it's still fast enough. But if you have complex calculations did, uh, done in the blockchain, maybe for just a value of a couple of cents, the transaction costs will be way higher. So have a look on how to solve that outside of the blockchain. And really have a look on that complexity because Otherwise, maybe people just want to invest a couple of cents and have to invest euros to invest those couple of cents. Maybe in the future, with proof of stake coming up, uh, it's already in, in the test phase, transactions will become uh, way cheaper and uh, way quicker. Then it might be cool to have more complexity in there and to have really a fully decentralized approach, but at the moment it's extremely expensive. So. Now we've uh, seen two projects, one completely centralized, one decentralized, but uh, to really go into a production mode, neither of those modes is really the one you can use at the moment. The one you need to use is in between those two. Ticket is our ticket platform, so what is that able to do? Uh, with Ticket, you've got the opportunity to create events so uh, like this Ethereum cam, you would have the opportunity to uh, just put that online and let other people use that without MetaMask or anything because um, there's one thing which we all do still. I mean, is there anybody of you who is on a regularly basis spending Ether somewhere? Most likely not. We're all still using our credit cards we're using Jiro Pay as a forward and uh, many other payments. That's just unavoidable. Uh, and especially, you cannot use it in, within your mobile browser. And uh, with more and more mobile transactions coming up, you just need still those payment methods. It's and uh, so you can, within tickets, you can buy those tickets and later on use your personal private key within the application or a managed one, I'll come to that la uh, later on. And uh, you can share that event with other um, attendants and uh, then on the event you can really check whether uh, the ticket is stored on the blockchain or not in real time. All that's done, just in a minute. And the thing coming up in the next uh, few months is something which we don't have so far here in Germany. You, you have the opportunity to sell tickets and have the causality between payment and service. Ticketing at the moment, uh, whoever is buying a ticket from somebody else is mostly doing that um, via personal contacts. That's over 50% uh, in Germany. And how do, you, how do you know about other people having tickets? Maybe an online channel. Then you maybe do a bank transfer, PayPal. Those are the most common uh, ways of buying it. But then afterwards, you don't know whether you receive the ticket or not, and the other person who's sending you the ticket, maybe it's just two days until the event, so you don't know whether the bank transfer is really coming to you or not. And this ticket platform is allowing you as a seller to have a fully integrated way, so uh, we can guarantee that that ticket is really transferred on the blockchain to your address, so you can see within just a few seconds that it's really there, and on the other side, um, the guy who's uh, selling you the ticket already has the money. So there are two ways of selling. Um, first of all, like buying, uh, you can either pay with Ether or with our still fiat currency. And the beautiful thing is if you're going a midway, is also that you can integrate such devices also for ticket buying. I mean, it's kind of... <laughs> Still a new device, but uh, it's possible. <laughs> and uh, how does it look like then? In, um, within your browser, you just have a simple web shop where you can uh, 
then press on checkout, put in your credit card details uh, on your smartphone, or um, if the event host is allowing you, uh, you can also pay via Ether then uh, from uh, the status browser or via the website. And then with MediaMask on the desktop, I mean there. So either status or MediaMask in the browser, otherwise with Ether or wherever you are, whatever you want to pay with, with your smartphone. And then you have the common processes. I mean, uh, that invoice, again, has some informations within it which you need to store somewhere else and you need to have it accessible uh, for uh, the tax offices then later on. There's sensible information contained in it. So um, your address in case you paid via credit card uh, and as per our data laws, you can, cannot store that within the blockchain at the moment or at least not in Ethereum because other people could read it and you cannot really delete it especially with the uh, uh, general data protection law coming up in May, an extremely critical thing. Uh, and then the most important thing you will, if you're not giving us an Ethereum address uh, within the checkout process, um, we have to create a private key for you. Really not recommendable um, because if other people have your private key, they can do <laughs> all, everything with it. Um, but the thing is, not all people of us have an Ethereum address so far. Same as paying with Ether. There has to be a midway until uh, it's coming more and more up. But you don't need MetaMask in order to uh, give us your address. So if you have that stored on your smartphone, you can simply type that in within the checkout process. And we store the record of the ticket on the blockchain. Um, with your address. So you don't need to sign that transaction because the host itself is someone you need to trust in some way at least because whenever you're at the venue, that's something which is not controllable by a blockchain, whether uh, the host thinks you're maybe just for a party, just too drunk, <laughs> possible, <laughs> and they just don't let you in, that's not controllable. And uh, therefore, uh, this step is something which is from my point of view, as okay as possible uh, to do that uh, <coughs> a bit. Hmm? Uh, to just do a bit off chain, but what's really so wonderful about using Ethereum within that application is the following. You can sign, if you've provided your own address, you can really create your own ticket and prove your ownership at the venue. After the checkout process, you're getting redirected within our shop, and uh, then you click on create your ticket, and afterwards you will get that pop up there. And MetaMask allows you to do, uh, besides just confirming a normal transaction, you can also sign a message. So uh, you can sort of sign like a contract, in this case a ticket. So with your private key, you're signing that ticket. And that QR code uh, is a signature of the event code. And then at the venue, you can use your smartphone as a host, scan that QR code, and with that, checking in real time because reading, no mining, and uh, you can check in real time uh, whether the person really owns the ticket or not. So that's something which is really possible in real time. Just the purchase proce process, and while you're purchasing a ticket, what are 20 or 30 seconds? Doesn't really matter until the mining is done and you really see that the ownership record is there. And afterwards, if you're selling that ticket, the ownership um, record is some on someone else. So with that transfer, that ticket becomes invalid if you're not owning another ticket. Possible, but uh, if you're just buying one, then that ticket would be invalid and uh, the phone would show you, well, somebody just signed something. I mean, you, that, this is still fakeable, the ticket itself, the document, but not the QR code and the content on the blockchain. 
And another beautiful thing you can do with signing is sort of a login. At the moment, you still have your uh, email address and password, but using uh, that signature, you could also sign to that agreement. And with that, having a re having a real time no, okay, that animation doesn't work. Um, have a real time login, so within just less than a second, you can actually see that you're logged in afterwards, and uh, therefore just providing information to uh, to, a, to an end user, which is really belonging to that Ethereum address and not to anybody else. This is the only way of proving within an application that you're really owning that address without actually mining something. It's completely for free. You can just store <coughs> that Ethereum address of a user after that login and, can, uh, and know via elliptic curves that that's a public key that you used. So after you've signed that, that's get, getting sent to the API and using elliptic curves, uh, you can recover uh, using that string the public key of that, so you're 100% sure that's the user. But how's all of this really done from an architectural per perspective? It's more or less the same than the other two ones, except from one single thing, and that's basically the non-blockchain brain uh, of uh, this application integ fully integrated with the blockchain. So um, you can use sort of a normal API interface within a web shop whenever you have, uh, have to access absolutely transaction critical information. So using Web3, whenever you're buying, buying something and not using Ether, you have to go, go through that path and read from the smart contract the price of the ticket and can later on then, whenever you're through the process and have actually bought the ticket, um, this, sort, um, this API will do the ownership record here and then later on you will have, uh, after, after the next block, your ownership record stored on that. Or if you're pay paying via Ether, just the normal way, through MetaMask, signing, get node, and at some point, live and smart contract. So this is one really great way to combine both worlds, the traditional payments, the traditional user at the moment. I mean, smartphone is still kind of new, but it's becoming more and more sort of a tradition. And uh, the absolute power user who's already paying with Ether or at least using MetaMask with, with his address to really getting items via that. And the main learnings of that, uh, it was kind of easy to integrate the um, a fully, in, uh, fully integrated um, API with Ethereum because there's one absolutely beautiful thing if you're no, using Node.js and maybe to store the non transactional critical data uh, in a database, uh, you can uh, use JSON end to end. So you have JSON coming out uh, of Web3, JSON in the database. And um, if you're using Angular or any other front-end uh, front uh, framework using JavaScript, you then again have JSON there and from all other payment interfaces, again, JSON. So it's just one format, no mapping uh, required there. It's really end-to-end, -end, which is re what is really challenging uh, using that architecture is uh, that you're having some data stored on the chain, some in the database, so uh, it's sometimes a bit challenging to uh, merge that data uh, into one API response, which is uh, still not too challenging, but um, when you're starting it, it's a bit weird. A really happy surprise uh, is legal compliance when paying with Ether. Sounds totally weird, but uh, the thing is, whenever you're accepting as a vendor uh, money on behalf of others, so in that case, um, when we are collecting money from you uh, as a ticket buyer and just deducting our, uh, our handling fee and transferring the money to someone else, to the host, 
you would need a banking license for that in Germany. But the thing is, if you're using Ether payments and the smart contract is handling that, uh, that, that, that transfer, so one coming in, one going to your host, and one going to us as a platform, you never have the control about the money and the consequence, according to uh, Linklaters, who have, we've been discussing that with, is you don't need that license for that. You just need it for the fiat payments again. <laughs> so uh, it's not only uh, a real uh, challenge to integrate fiat payments within that, it's also, uh, from a legal point of view, even more complex. Uh, so whenever you're just having some fiat payers, maybe in the future, it might be way easier if you're just offering Ether payments, but as we all know so far, only a few of us are using it, so maybe, uh, maybe in a couple of years this will be a real advantage. What the hell is that? So how am I approaching I new ideas? First of all, I'm always considering what what is the real value of a blockchain as a solution? I mean, mostly you're just thinking, well, and you're, if you're especially uh, whenever I was just starting uh, using blockchain technology, I was, well, blockchain is cool and you just start with it. But this is one of the most common mistakes because a blockchain is really just there to, to store and to secure the absolute transaction critical information and to process that. So really, the first point, think deeply about what is the real value Ethereum or any other blockchain technology is providing, and then maybe just write um, a short concept about that and model the basic application. So what other things do you have in there? Maybe some other uh, systems you need to include and how do you actually store the data just from a real basic point of view? And last but not least, it's basically the, uh, very similar to step one, but just a bit, uh, in a bit more detailed way what I'm doing, uh, is defining, uh, defining the absolute specific role of a blockchain within that application. Is there a real benefit of using it? Or is it just <coughs> cool to use in there? And in order to really uh, get quickly to, to a decision and to not offer a specific time, uh, it, um, so, uh, you maybe just think that, well, I just put so much work into it, I really need to do that, come to a specific, uh, come to a really quick dis decision, so just take, don't take more than 90 minutes for that whole cycle. Because afterwards, if you're not thinking that a blockchain is providing a value, it really won't. You just think that it does, sometimes. <laughs> So what are the do's and don'ts uh, for smart contracts and uh, using blockchain in an application, especially Ethereum? Splitting an implementation into an on-chain and off-chain is extremely crucial <coughs> because of cost, on from a cost perspective and as I mentioned, data protection law. Sure, blockchain is new, but still um, more and more regulators uh, will have a look on the app uh, on your application and especially with that new uh, fines you have to pay with the <laughs> with a uh, general data protection law, it's becoming extremely expensive. Just do one mistake and costs you quite quickly a couple of thousands or even millions. Uh, so try to be compliant, <laughs> really. And uh, just use Ethereum for absolutely transaction critical information. I really cannot stress that enough. If there is any information which is just nice in the user interface uh, to show to the user, store it in a database or maybe use another medium, but definitely not a smart contract. And in order to integrate more devices, such as, uh, as I showed earlier, like uh, maybe you want to, uh, you as a host want to know how many tickets you sold, integrate an API layer and you can basically integrate anything. So you still will have in the future uh, a CRM system, a normal ERP system in, in, within your company. All this uh, sort of stuff needs to be integrated. 
And it's quite unlikely that within the next few weeks or months that uh, SAP will become, uh, will getting uh, a Web3 implementation. I really doubt that. <laughs> So what are the don'ts of uh, smart contract implementation? If you're just doing a point-to-point -point transfer without any further logic, sure, smart contracts are cool, but that's not what it's for. There should be some sort of logic within that. And if possible, do not store private keys centrally. As I mentioned earlier, there are cases like uh, if you want to integrate other users for who don't want to use Ethereum or uh, MetaMask or just don't have an Ethereum client at the moment. Uh, sometimes it's, you cannot avoid that, but try it. Try to avoid storing any sort of private keys. And if you're storing them, give the user later on the opportunity to get that private key so that he or she can use it within his browser later on. And last but not least, really don't use uh, Ethereum with an application only because it's, you, know, you think it's cool or especially sometimes, uh, especially in these times, some management boards tend to say, well, we need to use blockchain, we definitely need to put it in there. I heard that on a conference. Uh, discuss it deeply with them and try to convince them that it's not always useful to use it. Sometimes it's just a really slow database if it's not providing additional value. It's not quick, it's just secured. In most <coughs> cases, that security is, is giving a, a value, but not in all cases. I would like to uh, <coughs> close this first part of the session with uh, a statement of Steve Jobs. Technology can either be beautiful or should be invisible. And that's something which you always should keep in mind whenever you're building applications. When you're doing it right, when you're using Ethereum correctly, it won't feel like you're actually using blockchain within an application. It just will be beautiful from a security point of view. It will be absolutely great. Thank you.